We work on the Lighthouse client. Uh, so we are, we're going to be talking about reducing beacon chain bandwidth for institutional and home stakers. And I'm going to leave it up to Diva, who's a Bogota local and our peer-to-peer -peer network expert to kick us off. OK, so first thing that we need to check in order to analyze how to reduce bandwidth for institutional and home stakers is how does the, what does the bandwidth look like right now? We are going to be looking at data from Lighthouse like Aish said, uh, we work on Lighthouse. It's one of the production beacon nodes. There are many others. Uh, Teku, Prism, Nimbus, Lowstar. We are the second most popular one. And while the data we're going to be looking at is Lighthouse, um, we are certain that this applies to any other client across the network. So have that in mind. First thing to notice is that bandwidth associated to a beacon node is proportional to the number of validators it, ha it has attached. Um, you can see that it increases when the number of validators goes up, but then at 64 validators, it uh, stays more or less the same. 64 is going to be a really important number in this talk. Aish is going to explain uh, further why and why it's important. So yeah, we need to remember simply that we are going to stop at 64, and this is where bandwidth is going to be more or less stable. Now, if we look at how many validators does uh, every beacon node on the network has, uh, we're going to have like main three groups. We're going to have those that don't have any validator attached, only simple beacon nodes, uh, node staking beacon nodes. Now we're going to have those that we are going to come home stakers, which have less than 10 validators. In this graph, you're going to see a very big bar. That's the one with zero validators. I hope you can see it. Uh, those are a very big chunk of the network, almost 60% of the network. Then we have uh, those that we call home stakers. Most of them have just one validator. And then we have those that we call institutional stakers. Those are the ones that have more than 64 validators which is uh, the big war at the end. Now, why do we care about bandwidth to begin with? So there are a couple of downsides of high bandwidth. The first one is, of course, an increased cost. Uh, if this cost comes from running, uh, for example, in the cloud, where you're char charged for uh, data, data transfer. And it's also a matter of diversity. Because this means that you're only able to run a full node in devices that support uh, processing all the data that you're receiving from the network and for people that are able to pay for the services in which these nodes are being running. Um, I see a few devs here, more my colleges, for example. Um, we know that there is going to be an upgrade to the network that is going to bring a lot of a big, big increase in bandwidth, like a lot. So we need to start tackling this problem right now before this happens. That's another big reason why this is important. Um, also, another really, really important reason is when we say, for example, a diversity problem, the truth is if you are, for example, a home staker and you're running your beacon node with your single validator attached, and then your brother or your sister starts playing video games, then you're going to have a bandwidth spike and you might lose attestations, you might miss attestations, uh, blocks. So basically, you're losing money simply because very, very short spikes in bandwidth. So yeah, we don't want that. Now let's check where is the bandwidth coming from. For the sake of this talk, we are going to separate protocols between discovery and non-discovery. So why is that? Because discovery has uh, its own transport, its own encryption, it's over UDP, whereas all the leaf P2P, we're going to call them leaf P2P protocols, uh, they're over TCP. We have gossip sub and the request response. The one we are going to be focusing mainly in this talk is gossip sub. Now that we have this separation between, let's say, discovery and not discovery, let's check 
where is the bandwidth coming from. This is what the bandwidth, uh, total bandwidth, looks like for one of our nodes for the last couple of days. Is it discovery? Is it live PDP? What is it? So now we have two graphs. The purple one is going to be discovery, is all the discovery bandwidth. And the other one in the bottom is the live PDP bandwidth. Now forget about the scales. This is just like a non, not very sciencey as analysis of the shape, of the shape of the bandwidth. So I guess we can more or less agree that bandwidth has the shape of the live P2P one, whereas discovery is, well, is very negligible as we will see. So the total bandwidth is around 250 kilobytes per second. Is it better like this? Yeah. Okay. Uh, about 250 kilobytes per, sec per second. Then we have live P2P, which is around 200 kilobytes, and then discovery, which is between 40 and 60 kilobytes per second. So for the sake of uh, doing analysis over bandwidth, discovery is really not important. So we're going to focus on live P2P. So I was saying we have gossip sub and request response. We're going to focus on gossip sub. So in gossip sub, gossip sub is a publish subscribe system protocol. Uh, we publish messages to the network those get disseminated to other peers, and we receive messages to subnets where to topics to which we are uh, subscribed. We have large amounts of data, and those we split between subnets. Again, here we have 64 attestation subnets, which again, H is going to be uh, talking further uh, in a moment. And then uh, we need to think how many subnets are we subscribed to, since this is, since this is the reason why we get so many, so much bandwidth. And the reason is that right now, each beacon node is subscribing to one subnet for each validator that it has attached. And yeah, well, subscribing to a subnet means a lot more of bandwidth. So a very simple example of how GossipSub works. GossipSub has a lot of parameters, but one that we care a lot is the mesh degree. So this example is the three, uh, three mesh degree. So we are going to start with our guy in the middle, that one. I hope you are seeing the red circle, just right in the middle. So this guy has a validator attached, is going to publish a block. So it's going to pick, to pick three peers, it's going to disseminate the message, and then each peer is going to do the same with some other three peers, and so on, and so on. So if you think about this for a moment, you're going to realize that it's very likely that I know this is going to receive one single, one unique message a lot of times from very different uh, nodes across very different paths in the network from the source to themselves. Okay, so why do we like gossip sub? Or why do we like the way we do this, uh, this message propagation? So it makes for a very robust network in the sense that we are sure that if we publish a message and we have this kind of topology, the message is going to reach all other nodes in the network in a timely manner. We also know that uh, we have low message latency. This mean, that means um, the time that, hap that is, is spent between the creation of the message in the source node to when you receive it is not very long, and this is as I was saying, because of uh, lower paths, smaller paths, lower hoops. But then again, we have a lot of duplicates, and this redundancy results in high bandwidth. This is a graph that we have for our nodes. So this is like real data for the gossip sub duplicates. Now, this is going to be weird, but I'm going to ask you to focus on uh, this number, the beacon block. So we know we need to publish one uh, block each slot. So we know for this topic, we're supposed to receive a single unique message. However, we are getting six or seven messages across the network. That means an, amplific an amplification factor of about seven. So imagine what happens if we were able to reduce that kind of duplicates. That's like a huge, huge gain there. Okay, so a summary of the current state. 
So bandwidth is proportional to the number of validators a node has. H is going to speak about how we intend to tackle this. And the other one is the high amplification in gossip sub. How are we going to do to reduce duplicates without harming the network? So I'm going to leave H to continue this talk. Thanks. Cool. Yeah, thanks, Diva. So I'm going to ha try and have a crack at explaining how we can potentially reduce some of these. So I'm Australian, and I can see a few Australians in the audience. And I think they'll agree with me that we have terrible internet, like ridiculous internet. I run uh, a validator at home, and someone that watches Netflix in another room causes me to lose attestations. So I, as a disclaimer, I have a personal vendetta to try and actually reduce this bandwidth so that I stop losing attestations. <laughs> yeah. So there's probably two solutions we have to these kinds of problems, which I just want to kind of briefly touch on and give you a, a feel for what we're trying to work on. One of them is called minimizing topic subscriptions. Let me try and explain that if you haven't uh, already covered some of this kind of stuff before. So a validator in an epoch needs to do some kind, needs to publish some messages on these things called subnets. Uh, in order to do that, you need to have peers to be able to publish those messages on those subnets. Now the problem with this is that peer discovery is, kind of, is a slow process. It takes a while to actually find some peers. And it's even harder to find a peer on a specific subnet that you need to publish an attestation. So the problem we've got, essentially, is that we need a stable set of, subnet, a stable set of peers that exist on each subnet so that we can find them easily when we need to publish a message. So it's not really an, uh, an easy problem to solve. The, the way that we currently have uh, this solution, I guess, is that Every time a validator is attached or sends a message to your beacon node, that beacon node is required to subscribe to one subnet for a very long period of time. It's about 27 hours or 256 epochs. So what that means is the more validators you have attached to your beacon node, the more subnets you need to subscribe to. And subscribing to a subnet means that you have to get all of the messages on that subnet, you need to verify those messages, and then you need to send them on to other peers. So you're doing this. That's a lot of bandwidth and a lot of processing. Um, so essentially, you're supporting the network at the cost of bandwidth on your node. So you're kind of being like a, a good actor. Uh, so there's a number of downsides to this approach. One is that it's not enforceable. So what that means is you, as a beacon node, you can essentially lie to us. And you say, oh, I don't have any validators, even though you've got like 2,000 attached to you. And you just don't subscribe to any long-lived subnet, so you don't consume any bandwidth. So you're kind of incentivized to do this. And there's no way that any other node on the network can tell whether you're lying to us or not. Uh, the next thing is, potentially, our subnets are oversubscribed. We actually have quite an, uh, a large number of beacon nodes on mainnet today. And when we originally designed this kind of process, we we didn't really realize how many nodes would be participating in the network. So potentially, we have more nodes than we need on each of these subnets. So that would lead us to think that we have excess bandwidth on the network that potentially we can remove. Um, so the idea that's being proposed is, why don't just every single beacon node on the network subscribe to one or many subnets? The, there's some benefits to this, but the general discussion is in, is in this um, specs repo as an issue. So what would the bandwidth graph look like if we did this? If one beacon node was subscribed to one subnet, um, rather than having it being proportional to the number of validators attached to you, you would then get this green line on this graph, which hopefully everyone can see. And that green line sits at around 500 kilobytes a second at the moment from what we've, what we've measured. So essentially, everybody on the network that has a validator wins in this, in this scenario, except for those that have one. So sorry for the people that only have one validator in this room. Uh, you guys then have to, you, your bandwidth will increase by about 500 to 100 kilobytes. Uh, the other benefit that we get from this, uh, so from a quick scan that we did of the, of the DHT or, or the current nodes on the network, we found that 57% of nodes apparently don't have any validators attached to them. So they're either lying to us, or they, they actually don't have validators attached to them. And they're not, they're not participating in any of the subnets. So if we do transition over into this state, they, they actually have to start participating and helping out. And it lowers the bandwidth for the institutional stakers or the ones that have high number of validators. Yeah, so essentially all the beacon nodes will now contribute to, to, doing, um, to, to helping with this subnet stability. So it kind of sounds pretty good that we get a, a massive reduction in bandwidth, but there is a cost. And the cost is how many, what, what is the density of, of nodes that you can find that exist on these subnets? So if no one was subscribed to there, we wouldn't be able to find those peers in order to publish, 
publish our messages on these subnets. So we still need a decent density so that if you just randomly look through the peer set, you can actually find nodes on those subnets and kind of hold on to them. And so this graph here is a distribution of the current density and what the density would look like if we switched to having uh, one, one beacon node per one topic. So at the moment, it's, it looks roughly like 8%. So you randomly pick a, a node, there's an 8% chance that it, it's going to exist on any given subnet. If we switch to one beacon node per one subnet, it drops to about 1.5%, which is 1 on 64, as you would expect. Um, the benefit of that is that it's configurable. We don't have to say one beacon node, one subnet. We can say one beacon node, two subnets, one beacon node, three subnets. So we can adjust. That, that kind of differential. And whether that's feasible is dependent on the number of nodes on the network, so that's something we need to measure. But the benefits that we get from this is essentially for the institutional stakers, which represent roughly like 10% of all the validating nodes on the network, their bandwidth will drop by about over 90%, which is kind of handy. And as I mentioned before, everyone that has more than one validator will have a reduced bandwidth. So fundamentally, we're talking about do we need all of these nodes on the network to support these subnets at the cost of the huge amount of bandwidth they're currently using. Um, and so potentially not, and it's customizable. Uh, the second thing is it's also enforceable, because we would tag a beacon node's node ID to a subnet. And so when we connect to a beacon node, and it's not subscribed to that subnet, then we know that it's being naughty or lying to us, and we can kick it off. So we actually have the enforceability property. Yeah, so that's one solution. And that's kind of a low-hanging fruit. It's kind of easy to do, and we get substantial gains. The other thing that Diva was talking about is message amplification in Gossip Sub. So is, if there's anything we can do about that. The idea that uh, we want to try and push forward is a concept called EpiSub. So Gossip Sub is a protocol that exists in LibP2P, as Diva was mentioning. And the LibP2P guys, which is kind of run by Protocol Labs, have had a evolution stage of Gossip Sub. They've talked about EpiSub for quite a period of time. Um, they've done a, a bunch of research, in particular Viso, uh, or Dimitri, who works for Protocol Labs, has, uh, has had this kind of vision for EpiSub for a while, but has never had the push or the drive to do it. But now that we're seeing quite substantial amounts of bandwidth, it's, it's probably time we try and realize this thing. So I just want to briefly go over the concept and, and what it's, what it's going to do and how it could help us with bandwidth. OK, so EpiSub. You, what, the biggest problem that we have is that if you have a high mesh degree, as Diva was saying, that, that means you have a high connectivity of nodes in your network. So every node could be connected to another 10 or 8 other nodes, and then you get huge message amplification. So every time you send one message, most of the network will probably have to download it 8 times. So if you increase that message by 1 megabyte, you're actually increasing it by 8 times, 8 megabytes, because that's the amount of bandwidth that has to be downloaded and then propagated. So naively, you would first think, OK, why don't we just lower the mesh degree? I did try to do that at one point, but as everyone points out, it's not, very, it's not a safe thing to do. We don't really know how the network is going to behave. Um, we can try it on test nets, but the topology or the structure of a test net doesn't look like mainnet. If we just lowered the mesh degree to two, for, for example, a mainnet, you might just not start receiving blocks. So we, we have to do that with either great care or with a lot of testing. So it's, it's an, an interesting idea, but we could probably do better. So another idea is to dy dynamically adjust, adjust the connectivity. Um, we also run into a kind of a similar problem. And typically, a lot of uh, the people that use our client, they, they suggest lowering the peer count, which is um, it's a false. It doesn't quite help you. Uh, so that's also not the best solution. So the idea with EpiSub is to try and minimize duplication and latency by making the mesh. It, it keeps the same connectivity, but making it a little bit more efficient. And by efficient, I mean we we're trying to remove the number of duplicates and at the same time, either maintain or lower the latency inside the mesh. Uh, and the mesh is just uh, a subset of your peers that you're connected to. That's where you receive your messages from. So that kind of sounds like we're trying to win on two fronts. We get less bandwidth and higher latency, which kind of doesn't sound like we should be able to do it. But let me explain the, the general principle, and, and maybe it makes sense. So the general principle is you're a node on the network. You're receiving all of these messages. Uh, a lot of them are duplicates. You want to just start collecting statistics over which nodes uh, are you sending you these duplicates and which ones are sending you late duplicates. And you'll end up having some distribution of um, the, the number of duplicates you get and the latency. So it could be that Paul over here in the front constantly sends me some late duplicate three seconds late, whereas Sean's sending it to me straight away instantly. So I come up with essentially a choking strategy is what we call it, where 
we look at all of the distribution of people sending us uh, duplicates and the ones that are late or the ones that have lower latency and we send a message called a choke. So in this example we say I'm going to choke Paul because he is sending me late messages all the time. Uh, what the choke message does is it indicates to Paul to no longer send me these messages um, over the mesh. Instead, he does a process called gossip, where he just sends me like the message ID, which is a much smaller thing. Um, so over time, eventually, based on your choking strategy, you should have a more efficient mess where you're only receiving the messages uh, with a lower number of duplicates, maybe from just one or two peers where the rest of them are choked, and you still receive gossip from them. So if the two peers that you have in your mesh are slow, and the other ones that you have choked are start at sending you message IDs before you send them in the mesh, we have an unchoked message. So we can unchoke them and put them back into the mesh. Um, so ultimately, the idea would be is that you're, you're dynamically changing uh, your mesh and how many, what, peers, what peers are sending you messages and how fast they're doing it uh, in order to try and make it essentially more efficient. Hopefully that makes sense. I'll, I'll take questions afterwards. Does this work, I guess, is the question. There's been some preliminary simulations on this. Uh, as I mentioned, Viso from Lip2P and Protocol Labs has done, uh, a work, done some work on this. He's built a generic simulation uh, from, for the Go version of this with 250, 500, and 1,000 nodes. Um, and so this is, this is with a mesh degree of six, so there's roughly about a six times amplification if you look at the messages in these simulations. But pretty much in, in all of the simulations, what this graph is showing you, is that you get roughly a 50% reduction in the duplicates from EpiSub. Now, as I said, there's a choking and an unchoking strategy which are left somewhat generic, and I think we can tune this to be significant, especially if we target it for the Ethereum network. I think we can get better versions of this, but at face value, it looks like you can reduce the duplicates by 50% just by adding these kinds of messages. Um, the next thing we probably should talk about is latency. Uh, I kind of suggested that we could get re reduction in duplicates and reduction in latency. Uh, the initial results that, that uh, Viso has uh, completed in his simulation seems that the latency increases. So on the left is uh, gossip sub latency distribution, where the buckets are like uh, milliseconds uh, since you receive the message. And on the right is uh, EpiSub. So you, we, we receive more messages with higher latency in these simulations. But as I was saying, uh, these are somewhat generic. The, the, the topology of these does not look like the Ethereum network that we have, and these can be highly tuned to, to what we need. There's a lot of like, research work going in there. There's a few people in the audience where I've, I think that I've promised <laughs> results for a, a mainnet version of this. So uh, us at Sigma Prime, we've built uh, essentially a production version of EpiSub inside GossipSub. The advantages are that it's backwards compatible, so we can release it in in our clients, it'll work existingly with every other peer and every other gossip sub um, node on the network. But if there happens to be another EpiSub node on the network, we can start getting this bandwidth minimization. So the fact that it's backwards compatible is super handy. We can kind of just release it whenever we want. Um, we're also working on a mainnet simulation so that we can actually simulate uh, the bandwidth that exists on mainnet and then uh, apply EpiSub and then get essentially more specific data that's more robust in how, how we can actually apply this to uh, what it would look like on an Ethereum 2 mainnet. Um, these, we'll publish results from this uh, very soon, and if you're interested, uh, just let us know. So the title of the talk was reducing, if I can remember the title of the talk, was reducing bandwidth for uh, institutional and home stakers. So if you're an institutional or a home staker and you came here being like, how do I get all these bandwidth gains? What do you need to do in order to get a 90% reduction? Uh, the answer is nothing. You just have to wait, we'll release it, maybe run a Lighthouse node, uh, and hopefully, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to reduce the bandwidth. But that's the end of our talk. Thank you. Some minutes for questions. Um, great talk, guys. Is this something that's backwards compatible, meaning that clients can gradually roll this out as time goes, or is this something that we all have to upgrade at once? Here we're handling basically protocol versions. so. We can run against nodes that are EPISOF compatible. And if they're not, then we're just going to run EPISOF version 1.1. .1. So yeah, that's what we mean with that. Yeah, we add a protocol ID into the gossip sub. And so when you connect to a peer, you can identify which protocols they support. If they don't support EPISUB, you don't choke or unchoke them. If they do support it, you can choke and unchoke. So it works perfectly with 1.1 nodes. 
Yeah, I just wanted to ask, why do we want to reduce bandwidth for institutional stakers? Like, <laughs> isn't it kind of a nice property that there is no economies of scale, at least if the um, if, if it's enforceable that they have to subscribe to things? Um, it just seems like, I don't know, it's weird to me as a concept to shift uh, the load from institutional stakers to like normal beacon nodes or like, um, I don't know, home stakers, even if it's like a little bit, but just yeah, it generally seems like we want those, uh, the lack of economies of scale. A good part of this is the part that Ash mentioned about being enforceable. So having 60%, almost 60% of the network being nodes that don't have any validators, we're not so sure that's true. Those might as well be institutional stickers. So the truth is that this is more like about being fair across the network. So it's more about that than targeting something uh, that is going to be better for institutional stakers. It's just that they happen to get more gains because of this. So I know uh, with 4844, we're going to be exploding our bandwidth costs. I was curious if you guys knew if that scales with the number of stakers you have, or number of validators you have. Uh, so just the question is that we're going to increase the, the block size in 4844, and how that applies with here? Like if that scales the way that under current gossip sub, our bandwidth um, increases with the number of validators you have, I was curious if that was the case for the increase in 4844 as well. Yeah, it, it's not. So the, the, the bandwidth increase is due to the subnet subscription. Um, when you increase the block size, everybody feels that because everyone subscribes to the block topic. Yeah, so that's, that's felt uniformly. Here the part that matters for what Mark asked is mainly the amplification factor and not that much um, how it behaves regarding the number of validators. So since we have an amplification factor of about six, so now with uh, this... Uh, this improvement, we're going to have huge block sizes, which if we continue doing things the way we are, are going to be sent across the network six times each, time, each block. So that's, that's insane. But it is, yeah, so it's related more about duplicates, that part, than the number of validators for each node. So you showed that by modal distribution where there's a lot of one validator nodes and then there's that 60% that were just regular full nodes, like not validators, and then, you know, uh, the institutional nodes with like more than 64. So that, um, I understand how the uh, EpiSub like helps everyone, and it like helps the home staker, helps the Netflix problem. For the institutional stakers, they're all running like data center nodes anyway, so I, I don't understand as much how the like subscribing to fewer Gossip subtopics uh, helps. So I think, I think this is a very similar question uh, to over here. So I think fundamentally we were looking at as as a whole, the the network may be consuming more bandwidth than we need to be. You depending on how how you build your client, you can be clever about which peers that you connect to. Um, when you have so at, at the moment you have these institutional nodes, right? They've got they're, they're not just institutional. Uh, some people. There's a pr usually a parameter, I think, in most clients, which is called subscribe all subnets. So you can, even if you have one validator, you subscribe to all the subnets. And the reason you do that is because you get some benefit from uh, seeing all the attestations. You, you get a, a slight increase in performance. So it's not necessarily just institutional people. Um, but the, the, in, the institutional, oh, I forgot what my train of thought. Um, the, no, I forgot what I was saying. <laughs> I, I did have a point. Maybe As part of what Edge was saying is that, well, subscribing to a subnet, we also advertise that we are inside the subnet, inside discovery. So that means that we need to find peers using discovery that are useful for us. So one strategy that people who uh, have the bandwidth for that use to be sure that they have Publishing all in time and everything is timely is subscribing to all subnets regardless of how many validators they have. This is what Edge was saying about maybe it's not exactly true that all nodes that have more than 64 subscribed subnets actually have more than 64 validators attached to them. 
Yeah, sorry, I remember my point. My point was that uh, we have these institutional stakers or, or people that are subscribed to all the subnets, and they become more valuable than every other node on the network uh, if, from a client perspective. If, you've, if you have peers that are connecting to you, and one is subscribed to just one subnet, and you have another peer that's subscribed to all 64, you're more inclined to be like, I want to keep a peer connection to that guy, because in case I need to, I need to send a message on one of the subnets, he's, he's, or he or she is connected to that subnet. So you, you're left with like, 10% uh, of these nodes are super valuable nodes across the network, whereas everyone else, you kind of just throw them away. They're not, they're not all that valuable. Whereas if we transition over to this thing, one, it's enforceable, which is something that we want. Two, we're not entirely sure whether the amount of bandwidth we're using across the entire network is necessary. So we reduce that as, a, a, I guess, maybe a side effect. And the, the, the third example is that all, be, all the nodes are equally kind of valuable to you. And because we tie it to the node ID, it makes uh, the node ID specifies which subnet they're supposed to be subscribed to. So when we're doing discovery queries, we can actually search uh, more efficiently for nodes on a specific subnet because it's tied to that node ID. So there's a number of benefits. It's not just uh, we're helping institutional stakers. That's just kind of like a byproduct. Hey, uh, cool to talk to you guys. Thanks. Um, so you mentioned uh, reducing bandwidth um, and uh, reducing latency to like avoid missing estimations. Something that we've looked at as well is like affecting the effectiveness ratings. Um, with validators, um, can you guys speak, which can result in like penalties or loss uh, re reduction in rewards? Um, can you guys speak to how this would help with effective effectiveness ratings, um, if it would? Um, which I, uh, I guess the first one is kind of what I introed with. My uh, my personal uh, attestation effectiveness drops when someone w watches Netflix. So. Uh, I imagine for a lot more home stakers that are kind of on the bandwidth limit or their, their upload speed is quite low, like in, like in Australia, and we re reduce the bandwidth requirements a lot. Uh, Diva said that when you have these peaks in bandwidth, you, you can miss attestations. You don't, you don't publish them in time, and it's not just missed, but you also get penalized if they're late. Uh, so even if, you, even if they still get included in a block, but later you get, you get less, so that, that lowers the attestation effectiveness. Um, from a lot of the people that use Lighthouse, we find that uh, the there's a number of main reasons that, that, that impact the attestation efficiency. And that's one is bandwidth, and the other one is CPU limitations, like processing. So uh, if you're running a, a, a node that's overburdened, uh, and, and this, the topic subscription is, is another thing that can overburden a node, because if you're subscribed to a lot of nodes, let's say you have five validators attached to you and you have five long-lived subnets, you have to get all the messages, and you have to process them. So the processing also kills you and, and lowers your, your average effectiveness. So if we get that in there, that all should, in, in principle, improve the effectiveness because of the bandwidth and, in, and because it lowers the CPU usage of your node. Would it be possible for a node to detect that it's been choked? If so, um, could it somehow combine that uh, with being dishonest about its subnet count and other grief or otherwise stall its local node graph? Sorry, I missed the last part. <laughs> could it other, if it could combine that with uh, being dishonest about its subnet count connection, yeah. could it just stall or otherwise grief its local node graph? Oh, wow. Choking is explicit. So I know this is actually going to know it's going to be shocked. We're asking him to stop sending messages to us. It's not, yeah, you know, it, it's, I know it sounds similar to what is happening, for example, in, in strategies, for example, in, I don't know, uh, file sharing, but it's different in the sense that we are the ones asking the peer to just stop sending the messages. So it's kind of a benefit for them. So when, when, uh, when we connect to a peer, uh, let's, say, let's say in this new regime where we have um, every node has to subscribe to a topic based on its node ID, we can look at its, its peer ID, but let's say its node ID, we know that it's supposed to be subscribed to, let's say, topic three. Um, the way that we, when we connect via Gossip Sub, uh, they should send us subscriptions about what it's subscribed to, and, and if, it's not, if it's not subscribed to that, we know that it's being malicious or faulty straight away, and we can just disconnect it. Uh, there's technicalities where it can say that it's subscribed, but then won't let us, uh, so, the next, the next phase of the thing is we try and create a mesh, uh, mesh network. So if we're, if, we're, if we're connected to, like, say, 100 peers, we only really form a mesh with, with the mesh degree, with, like, three of them. So in principle, they could always just say, no, no, you can't go on my mesh. You can't go on my mesh. I'm full. I'm full. I'm full. So that's one way to kind of grief us. In, in that scenario, um, they still have to forward us Gossip Sub messages. There's a, there's a, a small mechanism inside Gossip Sub that uh, it's called Gossip Sub Scoring. It's introduced in 1.1, which somehow mitigates uh, 
well, attempts to mitigate censoring, so where, where you just say that you're subscribed but you do nothing, uh, and, and the whole network essentially tries to kick you out of the mesh. Uh, in terms of while being choked, we only choke people that are in our mesh, so only people that are subscribed, and then once they've grafted with us, so we form this mesh connection, which means they have to be subscribed, they have to be sending us messages. If they're not sending us messages, 1.1 scoring will kick them out, and then we, then we choke or unchoke them. In order for them to be malicious and try and cheat that system, the choking abstract, the choking strategy is, is abstract and can be implemented independently on each node. So you don't know on each of your peers what, what is specifically their choking strategy. They could just pick random nodes on their mesh and choke people. So I think there is an avenue of security to, to look in there that hasn't been done yet. But I imagine we can probably solve that with some of the scoring parameters in Gossip Sub. Thank you very much, Diva. And thank you very much, Adrian. Thanks.